sisters and brothers. My name is Sarah Sachs Eldridge. I'm the editor of The Socialist, the weekly paper of the Socialist Party, and it is with great pleasure that I welcome you to this, the final rally of Socialism 2013. I hope the weekend has whetted your appetite to participate in further discussions, to continue the reading about socialist ideas, and especially to get involved in the fight for socialism. And I'm sure you'll agree that there is no shortage of issues to propel us in that direction. In fact, every week, one of the problems we have is deciding what to put in the paper, in the socialist. We could easily fill the whole thing with the facts and stories of increasing misery for the majority of people, which the continued existence of crisis-ridden capitalism means. But in our paper, we don't just report the bad news. We provide reports of the struggles of working class people, which we've been discussing this weekend. We provide explanation and analysis of what's going on. And we provide ideas for the socialist fight back. And similarly, this afternoon's rally will provide an antidote to the seemingly constant stream of bad news of cuts and privatization. I'm sure our speakers will provide all of the vital ingredients, the ideas of struggle, of solidarity, of internationalism, and of course, of socialism. Last night's rally for socialism highlighted the struggle, particularly on the industrial front. This afternoon, the emphasis will be on, uh, on the need for working class people to build a new mass political voice. Because as we know, I don't need to say it, but faced with vicious austerity, Labour's pro-capitalist, anti-working class position leaves millions of working class people with no party to vote for and no political voice. And these are very concrete questions um, with, uh, uh, for, for us with next May's council election. And it makes the building of a new mass workers' party an urgent task for our movement. So I'm going to introduce each of our excellent speakers as we get to them. Our first speaker is going to be very well known to many of you. It's Dave Nellist. Dave was the MP for Coventry South East from 1983 to 1992. But he spent his time in Westminster fighting for working class people, almost, of course, as we know, that's unique. In fact, he was expelled from Labour for being a socialist and for supporting the massive fight against the poll tax, itself a clear indication of the rightward direction of travel of the late Labour leadership. He's been a Socialist Party councillor in Coventry, but he now plays possibly one of the most important roles he's had, and that is as the chair of the Trade Unionist and Socialist Coalition, which is a vital step in the direction of a new Mass Workers' Party. Dave. Sisters and brothers, comrades and friends, in the next few days, in the weeks leading up to Christmas, Local authorities around the country will be announcing more savage cuts to local services. Already under this Tory-led coalition, some six out of ten councils are either limiting or planning to limit the home visits to the elderly with care needs to a maximum of 15 minutes. 16% of Sure Start children's centres have closed, 8% of libraries, youth clubs, street wardens, many of the services which act as glue to hold together local communities have already gone, together with thousands, hundreds of thousands of jobs of those providing those services as part of 26% cut in local authority spending during the lifetime of this parliament, but it's not enough for the coalition. George Osborne announced at the Tory party conference only weeks ago a further 10% cut in local authority funding in the first year of the next parliament, and Her Majesty's loyal opposition loyally agreed to carry and match those cuts pound for pound. Now, those services could have been, can be saved. If councils and councillors, they have the power to make a difference, they control budgets of billions of pounds, they've got some 19 billion pounds 
in reserves, but only if councillors like we heard of this weekend, Keith Morrell, Don Thompson from Southampton, prepared to fight, prepared to say no to the cuts. Now, there are isolated examples of that in Southampton, in Warrington, in Hull, in Harrow. There's been an abstention in Lambeth. There's been a resignation in York, another resignation in Barking. There's Tusk's own councillors in Preston, in Walsall and Maltby. But compared to the 6,837 Labour councillors across this country, whose only defence is that they're carrying out the cuts with a heavy heart, that's no consolation to the victims of those cuts up and down Britain. It's also <laughs> nothing compared to the history of when socialists were on councils. In Poplar, in Tower Hamlets in 1921, when socialists raised unemployment pay rates rather than subsidise richer boroughs in London and were jailed for refusing to obey the government of the day. But they're remembered today when the government ministers who jailed them are forgotten because of their maxim, it's better to break the law than to break the poor. Or the Labour councillors in the tiny town of Clay Cross 50 years later, 11 Labour councillors in 1972 who refused to raise the, rate, the rents that the Heath Tory government instructed them to do so, instead raised the wages of council workers. They were surcharged. They were barred from office by the Labour Party. They were banned from office by the High Court. But as the Chair of Housing in Claycross said, if we're going, at least we're going with a record. And in the 1980s, just like the speakers in that film, Spartacus, when, by the way, Claycross councillors were banned from office, a succession of local people from the local community came forward to stand in their place. That would be the lesson today to any Labour council or councillors prepared to stand up. And the battle perhaps in which this party played in its forerunner uh, organisation, the greatest of roles that of Liverpool in the 1980s, when 47 brave Labour councillors, one third of them supporters of the militant newspaper, refused to make Thatcher's cuts and instead established the real needs of their city and built 5,000 houses, built schools, parks and sports centres, gave employment to thousands of workers and were savagely attacked by Neil Kinnock in 1985 as a Labour council, a Labour council scuttling around the city handing out redundancy notices. Even though no one, and I repeat, no one during the three years of the socialist control of Liverpool Council actually lost their jobs. Where's Neil Kinnock today when there are 77 Labour councils who are axing jobs, who are cutting pay, who are cutting conditions? Those councils are a disgrace. <laughs> So, what do we do next May? What do we do next May when 4,156 seats on 160 councils come up? Do we leave the only choice for working people between the parties of the establishment who differ nothing on the direction of austerity, austerity but only marginally on the speed that those cuts should be made? Tusk has decided that working people deserve better. Tusk plans to stand next May on the 22nd of May 2014, the largest number of candidates to the left of the establishment parties ever stood in an election in the history of this country. Now, we've only been going four years, and you've heard the joke before. When I first Googled Tusk in 2010, the top result on Google was the Taunton Ukulele Strummers Club. <laughs> Not that now. We've stood nearly 600 candidates in the last four years in local and national elections, received over 100,000 votes. Some of those individual results are modest. I'm going to say it before anybody else does. We know we got less than 1% in Eastbourne. We know we got less than 1% in Lincoln. And by-elections are the toughest terrain a new political party can fight in. So I want to pay 
tribute and say thanks to each one of those candidates, whatever result they got, for flying the flag of Tusk in those elections. <laughs> but you know, within minutes of getting less than 1% in Eastbourne and Lincoln, Owen Jones tweeted joyfully how Tusk was a waste of time. But when a week after Lincoln, we got 9.7% in Caerphilly, or 27% in Fleetwood, or we win a seat just outside Rotherham, then Twitter and Facebook are silent from our colleagues on the left. Now, part of our problem is general visibility. Other factors as well as, hey, by-elections are unfavourable terrain. There are objective conditions which are difficult the nearer we get to a general elections. We know you don't win elections in the three weeks of a by-election, except in exceptional circumstances or with very large budgets. You harvest the votes in those three weeks from the seeds you've sown in the months before that campaign. But visibility is a problem. The only national TV interview we've had in four years of existence has been two minutes, 14 seconds I had with, uh, with uh, Andrew Neil on the daily politics in the general election 2010. So we need to raise our sights and stand sufficient candidates so the BBC in particular and the media in general can't ignore us. That's 15% of seats in an election. The benchmark at which the BBC grants a party political broadcast. Not only that broadcast, but also what they term as fair electoral coverage on local radios and regional TVs. 15% of seats next May is 625 con contests. Four times as many as Tusk has ever stood in previous council elections. Now, the work for that has begun. Meetings from Plymouth all the way to Sheffield. Committees established on Merseyside and elsewhere. Visits to union branches and community organisations. We think we've got already a third to a half of seats with prospective candidates who've come forward. Now, we need to find ways of discussing, especially with the trade unions whose representatives sit on the Tusk Steering Committee and the anti-bedroom tax campaigns, the anti-cuts organisations and other community groups to ensure that in every town and every city where there are elections next May, Labour can't hide behind its synthetic opposition to austerity cuts and a real socialist alternative is on offer. Let me finish with this point. <laughs> We're not even halfway through the plans of the programme of austerity that the capitalist class has for working people in this country, to save their banks and their profit system. Osborne at the Tory conference also said seven more years to the beginning of the 2020s with his plans for uh, cuts. In, re in reality, they're using the excuse of austerity to rewrite the map of social provision in Britain, to reverse the gains in public supply of education, health, social and welfare st services of the post-war period. And there's no challenge from Her Majesty's loyal opposition. No challenge to more cuts in welfare, more rising cuts of pensions and reduction in payouts, more years of people going, young people going on the scrap heap or trapped in dead-end jobs or saddled with £50,000 of college debts. But it doesn't have to be that way. This is still the richest, sixth richest country on the planet if what we had was more fairly distributed. Labour and Tory governments since 2008 have committed £141 billion to repairing the damage to the banking system caused by 2008's financial crash. Over the same period from 2008 to today, the top 1,000 individuals in this country have seen their wealth rise by £138 billion. Their lives are enriched by austerity while millions of our folk live in a street with a food bank at the end of it. If the division of wealth, last point, if the division of wealth in Britain was only the same as it was a generation ago, the average wage would be £7,000 a year higher than it is today. And the gap between the rich and the rest wouldn't be accelerated. Now, there's a single narrative in British politics today. Their crisis has to be paid for by our austerity, our youth clubs, our libraries, our elderly care, our health and education. Tusk intends to challenge that with a socialist alternative. Help us find the candidates for next year. Thanks a lot. OK, well, I thank Dave very much for that rousing opening speech. Um, now, in this situation,
generation of capitalist crisis that we're living in, Brazil has been lauded as one of the economies that were meant to save capitalism. However, the struggles of this year's, uh, during this year's Confederations Cup and the massive protest movement in June showed the world behind the economic headlines and, and that behind them lie contradictions which bring the potential for further struggles. So it's with great pleasure that I welcome Paulo Eduardo Gomez as our next speaker. Paulo is a councillor in Rio for the PSOL party, the party of socialism and liberty, which itself was founded when the traditional workers party showed it was incapable of providing the fighting lead that working class and poor people needed. So please welcome Paulo to <laughs> Thank you very much. I would like to introduce you uh, uh, a friend of mine, my friend Danny. He is my language body guard. <laughs> of course, my main language is Portuguese, and the, the, there is many times that I have no chance to talk with my friends in English. So I have some difficulties with the grammatical, so I would like to ask you to forgive me by the mistakes. Uh, first, I may say that I'm here to learn with you, to learn with you. Europe has given to the humanity the most important examples of fighting revolutions in the world. The French one, the Soviet one, and so on. This is not the case of late America or, or Brazil. Uh, I was... I am 63 years old now. I was 14 when we have in, in my country a dictatorship uh, from the military movement. Are you clear for you? And uh, the interruption of the building, the democracy building happens in Brazil. And we have for about 30 years with a dark uh, weather in the political uh, way to see the life. And we have no opportunity to make our country better than it is. During this time, we try to, to build step by step the, the organization of the works and from the beginning of the uh, 80s, 79 and 80, we began to build uh, a special uh, union called Central Única dos Trabalhadores, CUT. And together with the CUT, we begin to build a special work, work apart called PT. Partido dos Trabalhadores. Uh, during 20, 23 years, we organized the, the people, telling to the people that could be important to have a union and to have a party which belongs to the workers. The main important figure or public person is Lula. Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, the first president representing this new age for Brazil. We spent 20, 20 years building PT and building the possibility to, to arrive to the central government and to make the changes. Make the changes, uh, looking capitalism as a necessary to fight make the changes to make the poor people uh, becomes a little more uh, rich, not very big rich, but have conditions to have a, a, a life with dignity. And this happened with the first eight years of government of Lula. But there, all, there, all, there is no uh, uh, split, split with the capitalism. The bankers in Brazil, love so much Lula. There is no president, Germany or French or England or anywhere, any government in which the bankers love so much 
as loved the president of Brazil, Lula or Dilma Rousseff. So when I came to this meeting, and yesterday I had opportunity to talk with you, with a, a small group of 20 or 30 uh, people about the, the waves in Brazil and about the one million uh, people in streets in Rio de Janeiro uh, fighting, uh, looking for better services, health services, education services, transportation services, uh, against the, the high investments in World Cup, as we have seen in Africa, in South Africa, as we see here in London with the Olympic Games, we are seeing in Brazil so much money spending with World Cup, with Olympic Games, and the more important service uh, for the people, especially for the poor people, is completely, uh, how can I say, uh, precarizado. Made precarious. Made, made so many, many precarious. Is it right? Okay. Uh, Brazil is a very rich country. Very land, good land, but have no rich people. The concentration of the money is in the hand of a very few number of families. And there are millions of people that are so much poor, which has no conditions to have a good life with health, education, and, and job, uh, job to work, to have, to have, ha, to uh, allow, ha, give a, a good life to, to their families. So, it's, I'm glad to, to be here with you, because more than tell you about the situation in Brazil, we must uh, tell you that there are fighting, fighters in, in Brazil. There are workers trying to organize, to organize the fighting in Brazil. And there is a, a, a conciliation a very uh, new conciliation that is necessary to organize the people and to be together with you, to be together Brazil, Latin America, and Europe, trying to build a new kind of world. It's impossible with the actual age of the capitalism and the crisis in Europe, in the United States, in Latin America, show us that it's impossible to have a world in which we have dignity, uh, dignity life, dignity life for everybody with this kind of regime. We must fight capitalism. There is no way for us and for the humanity in the capitalism. We must build something new. We must build a new world. And it's necessary as an old man, much older than us, called Leon tell us it's impossible to have a special place to live for everybody, only one place. We must fight to have the world completely different. The, I, I can't believe it that the gold of Brazil, the petroleum of Brazil, the water of Brazil belongs only to the Brazilian. Uh, the water the gold, the metal belongs to the humans. And there is no reason to use this riqueza, wealth. the wealth of my country, only for Brazilian, the health of England, only for England, the health of Africa, oh, poor Africa, the health of the, the planet, the earth planet belongs to us. And to be divided for everybody, we must have another kind of regime. We must fight the capitalism. I would like that we be always and forever together building this new kind of world. Thank you very much.
very much uh, to Paolo for that uh, contribution. Our next speaker, um, well, let me say a little bit first, because I wanted to say that the Socialist Party, I think it's clear that we campaign vociferously for a new mass workers party. But we argue that if such a party is to succeed, it must be part and parcel uh, of, work, of the struggles of working class people. And our next speaker is going to be Rob Williams. Rob is the national chair of the National Shop Stewards Network. And the NSSN fights tirelessly to develop and build solidarity among workers in struggle. And crucially, with the Socialist Party, leads the campaign to demand the setting of a date for a 24-hour general strike. So please give a warm welcome to Rob Williams. <laughs> Comrades, Comrade Chair, I was over there yesterday and I could see now with his eyes peering out from the scaffolding and it made me think of some of the mass meetings I used to have in my plant in Swansea. If I'm a real romantic, when I was sitting over there yesterday, it made me think of Trotsky being taken to the modern circus in Petrograd and people wrapped around girders and bits of uh, scaffolding at that time. But I, I just want to <laughs> mention, we're not there yet, we get in there. But I just want to talk a little bit about Grangemouth to start because that's the, one of the themes of the weekend and I've read the press over the weekend and it's clear that the bosses, their government, the right-wing press and of course the Labour leaders as well would like us to think that after that setback they want to tell people, they want to tell workers it's now time to get in the real world. And when they mean the real world, they mean their world. Well, workers know all about the real world. They actually do know how much a pint of milk costs, how much a loaf of bread costs. They certainly know how much the gas and electricity bills cost because they're the ones who sweat and shed tears over the red bills and the direct debits. And yes, we have constructive criticisms over the events at Grangemouth. But I want to say one thing here. We can have our debates about what happened at Grangemouth and what the consequences are. But when the bosses, when this Tory Liberal government, when the leaders of Labour go after, unite, go after those workers, we send a message of support to Stevie Deans, the Shop Stewards Committee in Grangemouth and the workers on that site. We defend our own against the attack of the employers and the establishment. And yes, we understand the difficulties there. We understand in what has become an industrial wasteland in Scotland, we understand the relief of those workers that they cheered when that plant appeared to be saved and the plant decision to close the plant was reversed. We understand that. When you have a country where the World Health Organization warns that the one million young people not in employment, education or training, the NEETS as they call them, are at risk of mental illness and suicide and other serious physical illness because of the situation they're in. Is it any wonder the workers will grab hold of their job even at the price demanded by INEOS's director, the poisonous Jim Ratcliffe, swanning around the Mediterranean on his yacht. And doesn't this reveal everything about parasitic modern-day capitalism? That you can have a maverick who is, in effect, a one-man private equity venture capitalist who gets ownership of a key national energy asset through borrowed money, and he then not only blackmails his workforce into making concessions, he blackmails an old country that he can get £130 million in grants and loan guarantees of the government. And Alex Salmond is rushing around the energy companies to get a £40 million reduction in his energy bill so that he could keep that plant going. Jim Ratcliffe is still a billionaire who would have avoided all risks to him and the company by liquidating Grangemouth while those workers are now facing massive concessions to their terms and conditions and attacks on the very right to be in a trade union. And that's why we understand the feeling of relief amongst those, uh, those workers. And that's why we understand 
We, we perhaps the, the scale of what was necessary to save that plant, an all-out battle of occupation and the struggle to nationalise that plant appeared to those workers a bit beyond them at that stage, particularly when a so-called easier option was offered to them. But the reason why the lessons of Grangemouth have to be studied by the whole of the trade union and socialist movement is precisely because it poses starkly, brutally even, all the industrial and political implications. It shows us that in this economic crisis of capitalism, increasingly there are disputes that come along that are of a momentous scale, that come up against the limits of capitalism itself. And to win them, we have to have an outlook, a socialist view of society and even the world as a foundation to comprehend the scale of action necessary to win and to prepare the members for it. And yes, this setback will allow the forces of conservatism and cynical pessimism in our movement to raise their heads. The same people that sold out the November the 30th uh, struggle will be raising their heads now to say that struggle is useless, to say that we've got to wait for a Labour government, to say that let's stop all this nonsense about fighting for a 24-hour general strike against this cuts. And we aren't blind to the moods of workers and the working class in general, many of whom will feel the force of setbacks like this. But we are optimists and realists as well, and that is based on the actual real world facing working class people itself. You see, under capitalism, every victory won by workers is always under threat as long as this system survives. But it's also the case that there are no final defeats. We had the fantastic battle in Wigan in Orvis a few months ago of nightly blockades of that site. And yet, just before that, workers there accepted a 10% reduction in their wages. And it will be the same in Grangemouth and elsewhere, particularly when the reality of these concessions come home to those workers, as well as the promise, so-called promise, of 25 years of guaranteed uh, work. I think it's the same with people like Michael Gove, who thinks that the postponement of the action by the teachers' unions is the end of that particular battle. I watched those young teachers on strike 16 days ago virtually blockade the Department of Education and would have lynched uh, Michael Gove if he'd have turned up on that day. I saw the fantastic higher education strike last Thursday, the great picket lines on Friday night with the FBU and they're on strike again tomorrow morning and NAPO probation workers on strike on Tuesday. It made me realize what the real mood is. It also made me think of those young teachers and lecturers, many of whom would have been students in 2010 in that particular youth movement as well. And just remember that point. Only three years ago, we had a mass student movement that kicked off the opposition to these, this government's austerity. Three years ago, when we said from this platform that there's a student demonstration on Wednesday in London, they say there could be 20,000, and yet 50,000 students turned up. Just two years ago, we said from this platform to get prepared for the pension strike on November the 30th, where two million workers went out on strike and it was in a mass mobilization that affected every town and city in the land. The Socialist Party and the National Shop Stewards Network have a blaze, and proudly emblazoned on our banners the demand for a 24-hour general strike across, uh, with militant unions like the RMT, the PCS, and the POA. We should be proud of the role that we are playing. We know it strikes a chord, and we have to be tenacious in fighting for those demands. Comrades, nothing is certain in life, but in this period, the only certainty is uncertainty. How and when will this huge build-up of anger and frustration that we know exists will break out? We have to be vigilant, and we have to be prepared. To those who tell us that in the world of the multinational sharks, that our class and our organizations are too weak, do we point to the mass movement in Brazil, the mass movement in Turkey this summer that uh, shattered the political consensus? We warn them that a mass movement could have been triggered in Scotland and beyond around Grangemouth if the plant had been occupied in the days and even hours when all was to play for a week or so ago. A movement that would have put Jim Ratcliffe in the real world and shown his true weakness. A movement behind the demand for nationalization of that site. And there are many potential flashpoints. Other Grangemouth 
and perhaps not too far away. And by the way, if the economy continues to recover, then there will be many workers who will be demanding their share, uh, not, uh, not less. But one of the main lessons of Grangemouth, surely, is our workers need a mass political alternative to Labour. For many trade union members, and many in Unite in particular, Falkirk is a line in the sand, and particularly Miliband calling in the police, and now the people like Jack Straw and Miliband himself raising their heads against Unite and other trade unions. But if Unite made the break, if Unite called a conference open to all trade unionists and all those fighting the cuts for a party opposed to austerity, it would put the political establishment on their back foot and give huge confidence to this class. Comrades, I'll finish with these points. The other main lesson of Grangemouth is that this really is a class struggle. And to win it, you have to be a fighter, and it does help to be a socialist. You have to understand who your enemy is in the society that you're fighting capitalism. You have to have a program, a socialist program, to defeat it. You see, this year, you have to have a sense of history. We know about the centenary of the great Dublin lockout, but the struggle that followed that defeat. 80 years next year is the Minneapolis Teamster strike led by Trotskyists, those who came before us. But we lead struggles every day of the week. Members of this party, members like in 2009 in Linamar, in Lindsay and Vistian. This year in Mid-Yorkshire, NHS. In Whips Cross, NHS. In the United Housing Branch in London, in PCS, we play a crucial part in that leadership. In countless trade union branches and workplaces around this country. Many of you in this room yourselves are leaders in the trade union movement, but that we need more. The lesson at Grangemouth, we need more Socialist Party members in each and every workplace. I'll finish with this. If you're not already a member of this party, join today for these battles and the momentous battles to come. Right, our final speaker for this afternoon is the Deputy General Secretary of the Socialist Party. And I struggled a bit with this because there's many ways that I could introduce our next speaker. She's the author of the book Socialism in the 21st Century, and that's probably the best introduction that there is to socialist ideas, and I'd recommend it to anybody who is new to socialist ideas. And I'll just say that written in 2001, it anticipated everything that we are discussing and thinking about now. And in it, Hannah explains that on the basis of struggle, increasing numbers of people are going to draw the conclusions that they need their own political voice. But she explains that socialists don't simply stand aside and wait for those developments. We fight for them. Hannah Sell. Well, comrades, it's the end of a weekend. The last speaker, the last 10 minutes of a packed weekend of discussion on socialist ideas. And as our conference ends, another is beginning. Our class enemies, the Confederation of British Industry, the CBI, are starting their conference. And if you read The Observer today, you might think we've had some influence on them. The headline is, the CBI are rabid leftists. <laughs> this is based on, yeah, very true. <laughs> This is based on the very dubious grounds that the president of the CBI, Sir Michael Rake, has announced that he hates golf because it's a capitalist activity. <laughs> the Observer, however, have dug out that his favourite sport is actually polo. So, um, <laughs> And we don't think that the Leopards have changed their spots. At last year's CBI conference, they launched a campaign to prevent the banks having to pay a penny to all the people that they'd ripped off via the PPI scheme, Cameron spoke and declared what a marvellous job the British energy companies were doing, making profits for British industry. And of course, the CBI, Cameron and the rest of the MPs know nothing about having to choose between heating and eating as hundreds of thousands of people are in Britain today. Another piece of news in today's papers is the Mirror has revealed that 340 MPs from all parties 
are claiming their heating bills on their expense accounts. One millionaire MP claimed £5,800 in the last 12 months to heat his mansion. So they know nothing about what life is like for the rest of us. And there is no question that news, along with whatever else the CBI announced after they've got over their introductory speeches, will reignite the enormous anger that still exists against the MPs with their snouts in the trough, which is one aspect of a rage against every aspect of the elite in this country. The MPs, the bankers, the billionaires, and increasingly against capitalism itself, a profound anger is developing in Britain. Not just in Britain, but in every country internationally, the working class entered this epoch of profound capitalist crisis almost completely unprepared. Everything that had gone before in the last 20 years, the aftermath of the collapse of Stalinism, left the mass of the working class without an understanding that there was an alternative to capitalism, that they didn't have to accept this system. It also left the working class with a weakened understanding of its own collective power to change things. As Marx described long ago, the working class was, and largely still is, a working class in itself, but not yet a class for itself that understood its power to change society. So ill-defended, we entered this crisis, this profound attack on workers' living standards across the planet. And inevitably, there have been setbacks and defeats. But let's be clear, the working class has fought heroically. And all of those on the left, and there were many, who said that the era of class struggle is past, that working class people will not be prepared to stand up and fight, have been proved wrong decisively. Across the world, in Greece, in Spain, in Portugal, in Brazil, in Turkey, in Egypt, in other countries, the mass of the working class have fought back via massive demonstrations, via general strikes, even via revolutions. But also, as Rob has just made clear, here in Britain, whenever the working class has been offered leadership, they have responded magnificently. I was also struck by the teachers' demonstrations. I went on the one here in London. Tens of thousands of really young teachers. I must be getting old. I thought they should still be at school, but really young teachers who couldn't get into the halls. The NUT had booked far too small rallies, thousands of them milling outside and were desperate for national strike action. And it's an aside, but it's an important one. Our, member, our two members on the NUT executive, Martin and Pete, have been fighting for national strike action. And the anger against the leadership deciding not to do that is a real opportunity to get Martin elected as the vice president of that union. <laughs> not of the whole campaign, but of the key part of the campaign, and any teacher you know, get out there and convince them to vote for Martin in that election. But it's not just the teachers, the university workers, the firefighters, wherever there's been strike action, there is a real mood of anger and determination. But of course, we also have to recognize that the majority of the time, the right-wing trade union leaders are doing everything they can to prevent struggle. It may seem ironic, but actually, in a period of capitalist crisis like this, they are more scared of organising struggle than at other times, in times of relative social peace. Because any conflict can potentially become a conflict with the capitalist system itself. Look at Brazil. That movement initially started over a few pence increase in the bus fares, and yet it erupted into a mass movement that swept the country. And so there is enormous pressure from the capitalist class itself on the trade union leaders to hold back the struggle, because they have a dim understanding of what can develop. That is shown, by the way, by all the bile that they are throwing at the leadership of Unite at the moment. And it also shows that they're scared of us, it's not a coincidence that the Sunday Times today talks about how Lenny McCluskey still talks to the militant, i.e. us, 
the Socialist Party as we're known today because of the fear that they have of our party. But while there is enormous pressure on the trade union leaders from the capitalist class not to act, even the right-wing trade union leaders can be forced to as a movement develops from below. They can be forced to call a 24-hour general strike and before that, to call more serious action. We should not underestimate how the pressure is growing from below as workers understand increasingly that this is not a temporary crisis. It's not going back to normal. Today it's reported that there are now more than 5 million workers in Britain who earn less than a living wage and it's gone up by 400,000 in the last year alone. People have been driven into the ground and they draw conclusions from that, that they have no choice but to fight. I just want to give one seemingly quite small example, which is in this week's Socialist, you can read an article about theatre nurses in Swindon at the Great Western Hospital. And due to the leadership of one of our comrades, the Unison branch has put a fighting position. Management have put out an email to the whole of the hospital saying that Unison want a militant struggle. And one of the results of that is that RCN members are leaving the RCN in droves to join Unison because they want a militant struggle. <laughs> it's a small example. There are many other struggles in Whips Cross and other places which Rob referred to. But the reason I've highlighted that one it's because the overwhelming majority of those theatre nurses didn't come out on the 30th of November 2011. They didn't take part in that public sector strike, but as a result of their continued experience, have now concluded they have no choice but to fight. Even where there's a block at the top, workers will find another way to struggle. That's what the bedroom tax, the magnificent battle that is still developing, really represents, where people have thought, Maybe we can't fight in our workplaces, but we can win on this if we organise in our communities. Our party has a crucial role to play in the events that will develop in Britain. Those of you who are here for the first time have probably heard more about socialism, more about Marxism, more about Lee and Trotsky than you have heard in your whole lives before this weekend. And you will want to go home and digest all of the ideas that you've heard and think about them and read more. We would urge you to go to our Socialist Party branch meetings and discuss and debate these ideas further. But we would also say to you, join us in the struggle and join us in the Socialist Party. Because with or without our party, on the basis of bitter experience, workers will begin to draw the conclusion that capitalism as a system doesn't work and that they, as an organised force, can change it and build a democratic socialist society. <laughs> but our party can speed that process up enormously. This rally has had an electoral theme, and Dave spoke very eloquently about what we are attempting to do in next May's local elections together with our partners in Tusk. Let's be clear, in the local elections, also in the European elections, where we're standing as part of the No to EU, Yes to Workers' Right platform, for, but for us, particularly in the local elections as Tusk, we can bring together trade unionists, anti-cuts campaigners, and show to potentially hundreds of thousands of workers you can build an alternative. You do not have to accept voting for three parties of cuts. We can create the idea that it's possible to have candidates who actually stand in workers' interests. That's one way that we are fighting to move history forward. But there are many others. You heard at the final speech of the rally yesterday from Sabay in South Africa. He said, our South African section began when the miners' struggle erupted with a maximum of 30 members. And yet they were able to play a leading role in the miners' struggle and now in the foundation of a new party in WASP. We are lucky. We don't have 30 members. We have over 2,000. But we are still small compared to the tasks that we are facing. And we have to strive might and main to build the Socialist Party into a party of tens of thousands, 
in order that we can be not just an important factor in developments in Britain, which we already are, but into a decisive factor that can change the course of history and fight for socialism both Britain, in Britain and internationally.